thank you, Christoph, for the nice introduction. Also from Florian and me, a very warm welcome. So, and we are, we are very glad to give a talk today. Okay, our talk, what is this about? Well, it's about our DARES system, as Christoph said, which is, as he said, a distributed heterogeneous dynamic quorum based data replication system. Okay, now I think there are probably one or two people in here who might have difficulties with one or two of these words. So, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is I will start with the theory, what all these words mean. Then Florian um, is taking over the talk and he will, well, say some words about the implementation and present our um, demo application based on our library. And, well, I will conclude the talk with a little glimpse into the future about, well, our plans. Okay, so in here we had distributed right at the beginning. So I'm going to start with a distributed system. And well, Leslie Lampert said some time ago, a distributed system is a system in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. <laughs> okay, well, let's a uh, rather pessimistic view of a distributed system and well that's obviously not the kind of distributed system we want to have well because we want to have a distributed system which can be used in safety and mission critical context so for example if you have some flight control system enterprise data storage if you're doing some hobby project for your pet hamster you probably don't need it but okay safety and mission critical uh, domains means we have to be trustworthy, reliable, correct, available, and so on. Well, otherwise we don't need such a system. We have to be fault tolerant, and so on, and so on, and so on. <coughs> so, which means we have to be really dynamic. So if one node leaves the system, our whole system shouldn't fail. That was um, what Leslie Lampard uh, talked about. And we also even if there is no error, perhaps we want to adapt some of the parameters and properties of our system. So, the distributed systems, as they were well designed uh, a few years ago, must become flexible and adaptable. Okay, but first of all, what is a distributed system? Okay, a distributed system basically consists out of several processes, like P1 to P5 here, and well, every one of these processes executes a local algorithm and they, well, talk to each other via message passing, um, but, well, it's, um, they, they are not fighting against each other. It's not like, ah, oh, yeah, well, I want to do this and the other one is saying, no, I want to do this, but, well, they are working together to reach a common goal, which is, in our case, the data storage to, well, store the data in a great way. Okay. We have a few assumptions. So, for example, we assume that processes are either correct or failed. So, we assume that they can fail, but we also assume that, well, a failed process can recover either by itself or, well, we can restart it, of course. We also assume that channels are perfect, which means that, okay, there is no hacker in the middle, which, well, uh, hacks into our communication. Well, right now we implemented it um, in a way that the messages are passed um, using what just a plain text, text passing. We will look into a well decrypted form of communication later. And well, as you see, the processes are well. Every process has a connection to every other process. Well. In the theory, this isn't necessary in our implementation right now. It is still necessary, but that's also something which will be, well, fixed in a way in a future version. Okay, distributed system. What can we do with a distributed system? We can use it to do <coughs> data replication, storage. Or so. so this means uh, we not only store our data on one process, so that if the process, well, fails or errors, we are, our, all our data is gone, but we say, okay, we just store it on several processes, and these processes are uh, on 
in different data um, centers and in different cities and so on. Okay, well now we have the problem, well if we have the data stored in different cities, how can we synchronize the data? Okay, so if we just write the data to one data center, when are we telling the other data centers, hey, there's new data? So it's like, okay, well, do it every hour or so. Okay, that's a problem because what if um, I wrote something to that data center, Florian wrote something to some other data center on the same key or so, how can we handle conflicts? Okay, next approach is when, if I want to write some data, I want to write my data to every data center. Okay, well, that's also not too good because we are doing more than we have to do. And that's what the quorum-based uh, approach, well, that's where the quorum-based approach comes in. So again, we have our system consisting out of five processes. Every of these processes has some data stored on it, and as we see, the data has a version number, in this case, version zero, attached to them. Now, we want to write some data to our distributed system. For this, we just take three processes out of our five pro um, processes and we lock them. So nobody else can do a write operation or a read operation on these processes for this key right now. Next, what we are going to do is we write the new data on our three locked processes and increment the version number to version one. And you see, okay, for this process, we didn't increase the version number and we also haven't written our data to P2 and P3. And next, we unlock the processes. That was the write operation. So, well, we want to be reliable. So if there's one process down, we still want to write data and we still want to read data. So, well, even if there are two nodes down, we can still uh, find three other uh, nodes or processes where we can write our data. So, we don't care if two processes fail. But, well, three processes, again, we can't do a write operation. Okay, now you say, okay, but we only uh, wrote the data on these uh, three processes. How can we do a read? Well, it's basically the same approach. We collect three processes out of our five processes, for example, P5, P4, and P3, and say, okay, give me your version number. And then this process says uh, V1, v uh, version 1, and version 0, and we say, okay, version 1 is the highest version number, so we can ask um, process 4, for example, for um, its data. It has, well, the same tolerance and resilience. It's more or less the same. Okay. So, um, well, this is one way that you basically, well, use more, one process more than half of the processes. But, well, there is, well, a, a bigger theory behind it. So how you can, well, choose processes, when to write and when to uh, read. And this is called quorum systems. So, again, okay. we want to write some data. At the same time, we don't want to allow our system um, to write uh, data on the same key at the same time. So, because, well, to write operations, that's not good. So if we say, okay, we want to lock, let's say, some processes for a writing operation, no other application can say, okay, I also want to lock three processes or some processes for writing operation. This shouldn't be possible. Ah, oh, yeah, well, a quorum is a special set of processes with some properties I'm describing now. So every right, uh, right quorum is, uh, intersects with every other right quorum, meaning that if we chose this right quorum and locked all of the processes in there, then nobody else should be able to lock other processes because, well, the processes in here are already locked. Okay. If there are questions, please feel free to ask. Next, of course, we um, want to read the newest data value. So we want that every read quorum intersects with every write quorum. 
because otherwise we are not getting the latest data value. But we are fine that two read quorums or even more read quorums operate on our system at the same time because, well, reading doesn't change the system. Okay, this is probably a little bit abstract. So I have two protocols which <laughs> were... <laughs> Yeah, it's the, the theory is needed for the next protocol. So, we have nine processes. If we want to write data, we um, four processes aren't enough because with four processes we can collect these four processes, lock them for writing, and we can say, okay, at the same time I want to lock these four processes for writing. That's not working. So we say, okay, we lock five pro um, processes at the same time, and, well, we aren't able to lock another five processes. That's the five here. And, well, four processes aren't obviously enough to read the data, so we need five processes here. And, well, for ten, it's more or less the same in formulas here. This um, data replication scheme, how it's called, is an un uh, unstructured data replication scheme, meaning that all the processes are basically indistinguishable from, from each other. So they are just some process in some set. They don't have any other properties. This also will become clearer with the next slide. Scalability. Um, so if we add two more uh, processes to our quorum set, or to, to, well, to, to our distributed system, uh, well, each quorum um, has one more process. So, of course, we want to have uh, the lowest number possible of quorums in our distributed system. <laughs> <laughs> the crit protocol. That's just another um, data replication scheme. And, well, there are tons of them, so there's no end to data replication schemes, but I wanted to pick out these two. Okay. <coughs> I think it's the best to explain uh, this CRIT protocol with a little example. So, again, the blue part is for the write protocol. We uh, need processes, either the, the first column of the process, uh, of, the, of, the, of the CRIT, or the second column, or the third column. That's one, um, and all processes out of an arbitrary column. Okay? And then, out of every, well, other column, well, out of every column, we need some arbitrary process. No matter which what, I just chose P5 and P6, but we also could have chosen P2 and P9 or so. If we want to read, we just take one arbitrary process out of every column. In this, I chose P1, uh, P1 P2, P3, P5, P8, P6 would also be fine. And now you can think about it that if we have two right quorums, they intersect at, uh, always, okay? And if we have a right quorum and a read quorum, they also intersect always. But you probably also see that if we have uh, read quorums, well, we can choose P1, P2, and P3 at, as a read quorum, and we can choose P4, P5, and P6 as a read quorum. They don't intersect. It's fine, we can read um, at the same time. So. For write life process processes, that's the same as for the majority consensus protocol. For reading, we need only three processes compared to the five processes in the majority consensus voting. So in this way, it's a little bit better. Okay, what's about process failures? Um, well, it tolerates two arbitrary process failures. Okay, so if we, um, yeah. If we, let's say, kill the process seven, also we can't select all the processes for, uh, out of one column, so we can't do a write operation. But if I kill these two and these two, no problem. It's working reading and writing. And if I kill P1 and P4, for example, I can ha um, have P7, P5, and P6, and I can still read out of our distributed system. Okay. And, well, I think now it's clear why it's a structured data replication scheme. 
Well, because the processes have a logical structure, uh, structure they script, and well, the quorum cardinality is also well a little bit better. But yeah, it's not like this. Uh, this protocol is not better than the other protocol. It's just for some applications better, but for ap other applications, it might be worse. Okay, but well, if some process fails, errors out, does something weird. What do we actually do? Well, this is where we switch protocols. So, as soon as we well know that there was a failure, well, if there was a timeout, or well, the, the process just took too long to answer, or well, uh, really it died or so, we switch the protocols to, uh, um, well, uh, to a uh, protocol which is good for the uh, new number of processes. For example, if just one process died and then we, well, found the error, we are switching to a majority consensus voting with one node less. If, well, two processes died and then we, well, found the, uh, detected the failure, then, well, we switch to a corresponding two nodes less. This is called the dynamic protocol. So remember the title in the beginning, dynamic. <laughs> okay, next. Let's say we run a big system and, well, in the night we need some other, let's say, more write operations. During the day we need more read operations. So we want to adapt our protocol to, well, the, to other circumstances and we just want to switch protocols, for example, from maturity to crit protocol, or so. We basically do exactly the same. And this is called, well, a heterogeneous protocol. So uh, those switches are called epoch changes in the end, if there's time. And if you want, I can uh, explain how such an epoch change is working. But for now, I think this is enough with the theory, and I will hand over the presenter to Florian, who will give you a short introduction into our implementation. Thank you. Good evening, also from my side. And well, we heard a lot about the theory, and we sat down and implemented such a system. And first of all, I want to give you a little overview over the system. And, well, it's called DARES or DARES.js. Um, and first of all, uh, the arrows in this um, schematic are function calls. So API calls process and coordination and so on. And the boxes are either node modules. For example, API is a node module. and. The other case is that this is a collection of modules, for example, when we come to the structure of modules. So uh, if, you want to lose, uh, if you want to use there's JS, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you want to know something about the API. Well, let's start here. What should a good API do? A good API should take care about initialization and shutdown. So, we took care of it. Uh, you just can require theirs and save it in a variable and start an instance with new theirs and you have to provide an ID and a port, um, port for the network communication obviously and the ID um, we need at the, t at the moment a unique identifier in the system. Well then you have a nice instance and you can start it just uh, call instance.start and the um, functions which will also appear down here um, these are the only ones who are not chainable because um, we don't want uh, that someone calls instance.start and then uh, immediately afterwards a write operation because uh, behind the start uh, this instance has to be integrated uh, in the network and as we just learned uh, two slides ago, 
uh, when we want to alter the um, number of processes in our system, this is actually not trivial. We have to make an epoch change and this may take some time. So I just need to wait on the callback. Well, a distributed system with one node is a little bit boring. So let's make a second one. And well, we also have to provide the ID and the port, of course. And well, he has to know where to register to the um, system. So we have to provide an um, address um, where he can find the system which is already existing. And who is standing here is uh, does not matter at all. I just need one node of the system. Uh, here, of course, it's the first one, but this is uh, totally, um, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, so now uh, I can go on here, of course. And well, at the end, I want maybe to shut down the system and exam for example, free the port and whatever. So I have to stop the instance also um, handled via callback. Yeah, and that's really all about initialization and shutdown. And with these uh, six, seven lines of code, you're ready to use uh, theirs. We learned that we use a, s a distributed system and when we want to read and write, or uh, in the general case, store data, um, consistently and with uh, good response times. So obviously we need a read and a write function. So um, easy as that, we just say, hey, write. And of course we want to write a value to a key. And as the processes need also to communicate with each other, um, this may take some time. So again, asynchronous, um, the callback gets called when the write was successful or may even fail. And here is a little uh, difference. At the theoretical part, we assumed we just have one key. So we said, okay, we have one, uh, we have a process. This process has some value stored on it and this value has a version number. Well, um, we just uh, separate different values via keys and we can write to different keys. Uh, if we want to write, you may also want to read the data you stored. Well, I think no one was surprised of this line here. Um, well, <laughs> I read a key and of course asynchronous callback and those are now chainable. And we, well, we made the decision to, in, uh, to include a, well, a little bit of, special of a special function, get stored value. The name is uh, quite different from the other ones by reason, because this function won't interact with the distributed system at all. It will just look at the storage of this instance and take the value for this key on this is instance. So if you use this, uh, use it with great care because this data may be outdated. Also, if you just wrote something and get the stored value, you don't know if it's um, the current uh, value. But um, it, this function has proven useful in, well, first of all, the demo application and we think you can use it in other applications as well. Well, um, if you remember the distributed system, one process, or we, we, we said from the outside, okay, we want to write something to the distributed system and we have chosen some processes which uh, belong to a quorum and we wrote data on them. Well, at first they don't notice uh, that data was written on them. So if we want to react to that, we need listeners. And those listeners, I just listed them here, um, they can fire if some key got a change. So if I wrote 
um, from the outside on process one, a value to a key, then this listener will fire. And also I can deregister the listener uh, and I can listen to new key, key creation. So uh, the number <coughs> and the form of the keys uh, is not predefined at the startup. Yes? Uh, does it like fire if in any of the instances uh, the keys change or only in the instance that you reference? Um, only on this instance. All right. So if on the storage of this instance okay. a key is changed because it just randomly took part in a quorum, uh, this listener will fire, right? Um, because um, well, the distributed system is all about. I don't, I don't want to know um, to exactly what the others are doing, um, and those processes are completely independent okay. of of each other. So that's all of the API, and now I want to talk about coordination and reactions. And well, you can see it, coordination is located in the center and in fact it is the center of theirs. And well, coordination, in fact, it's a really big state machine and this is coordinating the read and writes. So most uh, times if you want to write to any system, uh, you don't just send the data uh, here, have, have the data, have fun. Um, you want to write in different phases and we implemented a three-phase commit protocol. So uh, the um, coordination first asks, hey, can you write, then um, sends the data and then assures that the data was written. And also, uh, the epoch changes which were mentioned before, well, um, on an abstract level, epoch changes um, are just uh, write operations with a bit little bit of extra work, so coordination also takes uh, care of that. And on the other side, reactions, well, um, distributed system, of course, they have to talk to each other and the reactions just handles all incoming messages and filters them out and sends them to the coordinations um, module or to the storage, if we see here, and or it can even uh, react directly. Okay, um, now to the next part. We talked all the time about quorums and, well, read quorums, write quorums. They have to come from anywhere. And that's where the logic part takes part. And in this part, we assume we have some abstract representation of some uh, protocol, for example, um, the majority consensus for five pro processes. And what logic does, it takes this abstract representation and it gener generates a quorum for reading or writing. And it, con it can do also uh, priori prioritize processes. So for example, if I sit on process five and I say, okay, I want to write uh, pl logic, please give me a quorum. Uh, it would be wise to uh, include this process five into the quorum because, uh, well, he don't need to do network communications. Um, we can do some optimization here. And also when I know, okay, this pr process seven, uh, it's crashed or it's uh, horribly um, slow. I want to ignore this process for this operation. Please give me a quorum uh, where you don't have process seven in it. Uh, this can also be handled uh, by the logic part. And now I talked about this abstract representation if we have time afterwards, uh, I don't think so, when I look at the clock now, um, I can show you how this works. Um, but this abstract representation, it has to come from somewhere and this is uh, this collection over here of structures. And in structures um, are multiple generators for different protocols. And at the moment, um, 
we implemented the um, majority consensus, of course, also the grid protocol, which you already know, already know. and the read one write all is also a valid um, quorum system or voting structure for a quorum based data replication, etc. Um, because okay, when I write all, no one can write uh, the other all or whatever at the same time. Doesn't work. And if I, I, I have written on all processes, well, I pick one, it has the newest data. So everything fulfilled, we are good here. That's the main part. Um, I just collected uh, the other three for, um, uh, to make, um, to cover all. And well, processes is, responsible for initializing. So remember the first slide, those calls are forwarded to process and it will initialize the epoch change to uh, include uh, the process to the system. And it also holds some global uh, variables for the system. Tunnel is the network layer. Um, from there, messages are sent to other processes and they're also, um, uh, messages are received. And the storage, well, this should be also at the heart of a distributed file, sto uh, distributed storage system. Well, now it's a key value store, in fact, just a JavaScript object uh, with some functions on it, read, write, lock, unlock, whatever. Well, uh, that was all about the implementation and I hope by now, you're eager to watch a little demo. So bear with me. Um, I prepared something, which is, um, I will find it. We have four folders. I call it watch one, watch two, watch three, watch four. And I made four instances um, of the system and wrote a little application on top of it. And those, Four systems will, well, the first one will watch this ordinal, the second uh, folder, the second one, this, and so on. And I hope I have to open them. Ah. Okay, now I have four, um, four terminals. Uh, which uh, already, which I already opened um, the different systems in, and I just have to start the backup system. And okay, it's running. Let's go. The second one, uh, you m remember, um, I said it has to register well to the system. Now it's the first one. So if I do now the enter, um, you see, okay, it was registered here. And well, now also this one is uh, ready. Also, if I start the um, for, uh, third one, um, now I've chosen the second one to register to. So the second process, is, process takes care of um, including it to the system. And the final one is, is included here. Okay, now we are ready to go. Yes? Yes? Um, no. Um, uh, well, this, this is um, also related to the epochs. Um, at least um, a right quorum of the new epoch knows them. So um, here uh, it happened that all four know each other, um, but um, well, I, I don't want to call it worst case, but it can also happen that just three of the four um, know each other. And In this case, when process two um, quits, then you just process one and process two because four doesn't know one and two? Uh, no, um, the, the fourth one um, knows uh, at least two of the others. For example, those two. Um, if the first one crashes, it um, 
knows this one. Um, I would skip this question to afterwards when, when we have time to um, explain epoch changes because, uh, well, it, it is just an epoch change and without the theory it's quite difficult to explain here. Um, but if, if um, for now, if some process wants to write, uh, he notices that, for example, um, a next process um, is now in the system and can react to it, so it updates itself on the fly. So this is taken care of. Well, okay, I said I want to um, have a consistent data store. And well, let's make a new folder. Now, um, this folder is on two of the um, four fold, uh, is, is um, on three of the four folders. And well, uh, in the background, this is majority consensus voting on four processes. So I need one more than the half, which is three in this case. So, um, well, it's, it's fine. Uh, this, this fourth one has now not the most recent version of Unbenannter Ordner, um, but it doesn't care when 4 would make a read operation, he would notice, hey, I have an Unbenannter Ordner here. Um, also, works also with documents. Uh, I have an unnamed document. Um, well, have to be. And now, this uh, first, first of all, the unnamed document was copied. That's because uh, that's seen here. And then I changed the document. This change is a write operation. And this write operation takes another quorum, in this case, those three. And it wrote, you can see the little um, text here. Um, it wrote it to one, two, and four itself. Yes? Uh, will it always, for write operations, always take a quorum, which is where the, the instance that you write to is included? Um, so you just wrote an instance four, would it always take a quorum with instance four in it? Yes. Um, in, in this case, yes. Okay. I don't need to, first of all. Well, uh, in this use case, Obviously, I want to have this one in there. Um, that's why I said in the logic part, hey, I can make quorums and prioritize processes. That's uh, what happened here. I prioritized process four, and it gave me um, a process, um, a, a quorum, which has the fourth process in it. Um, OK, um, I'm now one folder higher. and. I also can drag a picture in here. This should be recognized, and you now see it's piped um, via binary JS, um, also on a quorum, and it's there. It's yeah, fully functional. Well, um, if I now delete something, uh, this deletion, you just uh, saw it happening. This deletion is also just a write operation, but um, with a special, special tag on it, hey, um, there's, no, uh, there's now no folder any, or no file anymore. And now this fourth process has um, this document, but uh, it has a document with an outdated version. Um, so those three have Unbenanntes document in the most recent version, namely it's deleted, and this one is actually outdated. And um, we choose, we've chosen to not uh, save all the binary data of those files in the distributed system, um, but uh, there's a listener to the file system in the background, and when he detects, hey, something changed, something got created, um, it collects metadata from this thing, and actually the metadata with the owning process in, well, watch one or whatever, um, is written to the quorum. Then the listener fires um, on those other quorums, uh, on those other processes, and they know, hey, there's a new file, 
they see the owner and they send a request, hey, please give me this file. So just metadata is stored, um, but the data is transferred um, directly afterwards and well, we have, therefore we have the consistency. Um, I just could, uh, yes, please. So uh, this dead data, is it gonna stay there forever until we call Watch4 and Watch4 realizes that this thing should be dead? Or how is it going, what's, what's the life cycle of this dead data? This one here. Yeah. Um, well, if nothing happens, it will stay there forever. Um, when 4 makes a read operation on this key, uh, then will it, will, it will notice it, but um, um, what also can happen, I can write from 2 again to the same key, <coughs> and this key will now overwrite the old version here, and now this one is um, again up to date. So if no one interacts with this thing, um, it has no initiative to um, think its data is wrong. When it actually needs the data, then it will make a read operation. Um, yeah, that's what the distributed system is for. Uh, if yes? If only one person of the other person has a document is there and it's in an old version and they're trying to read it, it gets deleted. Uh, when I implement it, yes. Okay. Um, you, you would expect this behavior from a full-blown backup system. For this demo, um, I have not implemented a read, um, which I have to trigger somehow. So at the moment, uh, it would stay there. But for a um, serious backup, um, I want to call a read someday, and it would have noticed, hey, this document should be deleted uh, by the time. OK. so. I could make new folders in the umbenannte ordner and it would also synchronize. I just delete everything and this should also mirror. Yes. Okay, that's, um, that's this. And now, um, after this example. Okay, sorry. Yes? No, yeah, sorry, another question. Um, no problem. So so you're storing uh, also the fact that documents were deleted or you... Yes. Okay. So also this accumulates or, or it, it, again, there is a, a way to clean up all this metadata. Um, in, in fact, every write operation will overwrite the last written data at the moment. Um, so when I write to some key, uh, the old data will be deleted, uh, will be overwritten. And when I delete, in this case, some document, um, it's just storing, um, well, sort of metadata with a flag, uh, it's got deleted. And no MD5 checksum and whatever. Uh, some more questions, yes? Is the uh, storage persistent or in memory? Sorry, again? The storage, is it persistent or in memory? Um, uh, the, this um, now is, um, well, it's on the file. Uh, this, oh, mm -hmm. the, the metadata uh, at the moment, it's um, just in memory, uh, but on the um, Outlook, uh, we will talk about exactly this fact. Yes, one more question? Um, I want to know because there's this CAP theory. What, what, what for? Um, this depends on the um, protocol I choose. So what, uh, one protocol will have uh, better availability, but I need more processes uh, for each operation. Uh, you, you have uh, always the trade-off there. So there's no better protocol, but there are protocols which are more suited for applications. Um, questions for the demo? Then we will move on. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the future work 
just a, uh, a little closer in the end. Okay, so, no. Well, we saw this one application, but of course we want to have more applications. Uh, first of all, we want to extend this demo application uh, to make it, well, actually usable, or well, useful. But, uh, and, well, we have some ideas for some other applications. Okay. Then next we want to implement more protocols. So right now we have the three protocols, well, there are a lot more protocols. That's also uh, well possible to do right now. You say you write your own protocol is enough. Then we want to do performance tests on these protocols. Say okay, we what what's the best protocol if we have five nodes? So we can provide better default values, of course, even more tests and so on. Configurability. Uh, we want that it's like bring your own storage. Transport layer security. I to, um, said in the beginning we. Right now, we transfer the data using a plain text transfer. So, yeah. Read and write, or read after write, or how you want to call it. Well, it's, I think, personally, that's very important. So, imagine you have some number stored in your system, okay? And now you want to increment your number by one. But, well, you, you actually don't care what was the last number and what's the next number. The only thing you care that is one, well, higher. So what you would do is you read from the system, you increment by one, and you write to the system. Okay? You probably see the problem, what's happening there. It could be that between my read and my write, some other process wrote on exactly, well, this number and changed it somehow, and, well, I'm just overwriting the old value. So we well also talked a lot about this operation, how well one would implement this and well this is also something which is coming in future. And well of course a lot of other stuff. And well from now on or well since today afternoon it's also on uh, GitHub at uh, github.com slash TNG slash dares and it's on npm also with theirs. So with this, we want to say thank you. And do you have any questions? <laughs> yes. What is the use case for the SGS? Why, want they, why do you want to use the SGS instead of MongoDB, for example? Well, with MongoDB, <laughs> <laughs> With MongoDB, um, you write your data to your database. Okay, and w if the database is somehow crashing, you have a problem. So. But not if I have a replication set in MongoDB. Yeah, that's what um, what there's JS is about. So, as I said in the previous slide. Are you uh, reinventing the wheel here? Why? Okay. Aren't there a lot of replicated databases out there? Do you have to invent your own replicated database? What is better about the SGS than other databases, for example? Well, um, our part, we have these. Do you remember in the in the beginning slide? No, it's okay. The uh, distributed uh, heterogeneous uh, dynamic quorum-based approach and so on. So we can adapt to well. Uh, changes in our distributed system. Well, it might be that there are other approaches, out, well, other databases out there, which also well can adapt in this way. Could be, I don't know, but I think there are a lot of um, well storage systems out there which are like uh, on a fixed number of um, of processes, or that they only well say okay well. I work with only one protocol, but not with the uh, with different protocols. So they're missing the heterogeneous part. So, yep. Uh, how fast can it uh, reconfigure if one node is lost or one is added? How long does it take? But how? Um, so there was one failure, and you want to well see what, that there was a the failure. One failure or one new node, and say by a new server or something like this. How do you? How fast? Or Okay, well, basically it can take indefinitely long because, well, 
if the one process fails and you are not doing anything on your system, you actually don't care. Okay? So, it's probably here. So, that's our system, our distributed system. Now we say two processes fail. Okay. It could be that it's like four days that these two processes are failed and well, we don't care if we don't do anything on the system. So you have one master, you have, you have, you have to have some master node that sees, okay, there are two processes lost, uh, let's see Sorry. the other nodes too. No, 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 no we, d we don't have a master node, but what happens if the master node fails? We so have a problem. That's the question, what's the yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's not a problem that these two processes are, are failed, but well, if we want to do something um, on our system, and we have these two processes in our write quorum or read quorum, well, we see, okay, these two processes failed, and then we reconfigure our whole system, okay? But how do you see that they failed? <laughs> no, well, that's, that's a really hard problem. Right now, it's um, uh, with timeouts. So we say, okay, a process can take like this amount of milliseconds to answer. If it's not answering in this time, we consider it as, a, it as failed. Even if it's working, but it's just needing some more time. We also say, okay, well, you took too long, you, uh, you failed. <laughs> Um, detecting errors is really hard and, well, in some cases not doable, so that's... So then the other processes, uh, you see, okay, there's a timeout, they tell the process they're connected with, okay, there's a timeout on node P8, P9, and the other ones also... So I need to It's timeout of it or... Yeah, well, that's the app of change, Flo, if you want. Um, okay, um... Let's just play this through um, one time. Uh, we are considering majority consensus on nine processes, so we need five processes to write. Um, when they are not failed, well, if process six wants to write something, he can collect those processes and write on them, everything is fine. Um, when now these two fail and P7 wants to write, says to its logic part, hey, give me a quorum, and this quorum gives those five, uh, um, four, one, seven, five, six, uh, no one notices the failure down there, because the write operation, it, it works. Uh, also, the read operation with uh, fewer processes, um, it works. Um, if P6 or P5 wants to read, and by chance um, chooses the quorum, uh, eight, five, six, seven, one, for example. Um, then it sends out a message to um, those, hey, I want to write on this key, please give me a lock on it. And it waits, it waits, it waits for the responses and process eight, just don't answer. And then uh, process five initiates um, with its own coordinator, um, in initiates um, epoch change and the one who detects the failure, in our case via timeouts, um, this node is now responsible for the epoch change for the adaption uh, to the new um, system with uh, fewer nodes. So we detect an, uh, a failure um, if we want to access it and we fail the access. And well, if we don't access it, we don't detect it. You could, if you want, um, have some, uh, some leader who pings periodically, uh, but you don't need it, um, because the system, that, that's the cool thing about it, every process in here, if it notices a failure, can adapt the um, voting strategy, for example, from dynamic majority, cons uh, from majority consensus with, with nine nodes, to um, the same thing with seven nodes. So we, d we don't have a master, uh, all are created equal. Um, yeah, uh, does this answer your question? Yeah, almost. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
What, what, what's left? Yeah, what's left is uh, you said that the North who sees that there's a timeout, mm -hmm. uh, he's like responsible now, but, but what does he do? Like, what does it. Does he, it yeah. I don't understand what, what happens then. Um, like do we get five more minutes? Yes. Okay. You can also um, talk and tell me after what is the problem. Uh, we are already on the slide, so um, whatever. So let's play this through. Um, I want to switch to a new protocol, and well, I, I could just call all processes, hey, let's switch to a new protocol, but we are in the distributed system, and well, the whole thing with this voting and the quorums is that we don't need all, um, all at the same time. So what do we do? We take a right quorum of the old epoch and a right quorum of the new epoch. So um, first of all, we are in a setting with nine processes and we want to switch to a setting with, with seven processes. Uh, for nine processes, I need a read quorum with um, five processes and for um, seven, I need a this, this would be the new one. Um, I would need uh, four processes to write. So on the fusion of those two, um, here it's chosen that they are um, including each other, um, but this doesn't have to be. On those, I increment this uh, epoch number. So those processes, four, one, seven, five, and six, no, hey, eight and nine are gone, we are now on this topology. And if now P2 wants a write operation, P2 is, um, is still in this setting. So either uh, he will um, also get a write quorum, and I think it's on the next one, yes. Uh, P2 wants to write, and well, it takes a right quorum from this um, setting because it does not know that there was a change. Uh, how should he? And about, um, we have the right quorum intersection property. So if he uh, gets a right quorum, this right quorum we've chosen here must intersect. Uh, that's how we constructed the quorums. They pairwise intersect. So um, in the quorum, he chose uh, is at least one process who knows the newest epoch. And then he aborts his write operation, tells this process, hey, you got a new epoch, please update me. Now he knows from the new epoch, and now he can take um, um, a quorum with four processes for this protocol over here, and now he can write. And that's how we switch protocols. Uh, that's how we switch from different numbers uh, in one protocol. And that's called an epoch change because I have um, multiple well, epochs of um, voting structures in there. So P3, he is, well, he doesn't care. He doesn't know anything. If he wants to write, uh, the same thing begins from the beginning. Okay, um, are there more questions or don't we have time anymore? I think because we have to, to okay. fill the food outside <laughs> and the program uh, to come. Um, thank you again very much for your talk and for the time being.